please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. On the show today, we check out what Hyundai Motors has in store for India next year. Rohit tells you all about the Nissan Kicks 1.6 petrol while giving you a lowdown on what to expect from the India-bound Kicks. We find out if the Audi RS6 Avant performance is the ultimate family car money can buy. Also on the show, a look at India's first hypercar and also the Aston Martin Vantage launch. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, so we need that. Now, Hyundai has an updated Tucson coming to India next year, but that's not the news. The news, of course, is that it also has India's first electric CKD assembled SUV coming in 2019. Now, Shubhi went to Turkey to get a glimpse of the future. This is the 2019 Hyundai Tucson. The new Tucson gets styling updates that makes the car look fresh and upmarket. You can immediately see the new DRLs, the way the headlights blend into the grille. It makes the car look sharper, it looks more focused and more importantly, it looks more expensive than before. But there's a lot more to talk about. The 2019 Tucson is technically a facelift but they've done quite a bit of work and not just on the exterior and that's the surprise. Because even inside, there are changes and the most noticeable one obviously is that this uh, eight and a half inch touchscreen uh, is now sticking out of the dashboard like a tablet. Uh, it releases quite a bit of space, it allows the dashboard to be lower, there's a slight sense that the space here has increased at least visually uh, and it uh, does make this car feel a little bit more upmarket and a little bit more spacious. So on that front, I think that's a win. The other thing that I noticed is that these materials feel very similar to what we already get and there's no serious upgrade there. But there are a lot more things on this car because it's a very very highly uh, specced car. Uh, and I'm not sure that all of these uh, little bits are going to come to India. Uh, and most certainly this is the four wheel drive car with four wheel drive lock and I'm sure that that is definitely not coming to India anytime soon. The car we are driving is a 1.6 litre engine that we are unlikely to see in India anytime soon. It also features Hyundai's slick shifting 7-speed dual clutch transmission as well as 4-wheel drive. Mm, so let's focus on what we will get, the rest of the car in feel and behaviour. When you drive the Tucson, you realise that uh, it is an interesting car in the sense uh, that it drives like the old car does. It's a little bit stiff initially so you thud a little bit over the pumps but on the flip side it's extremely comfortable it's very car like to drive it's very easy to drive the Tucson is easy to like and it works rather well in India we already know this but when you drive the high-end models with the latest technology it does make you wonder so this car has a four-wheel drive uh, including a bunch of options uh, you can turn traction control off uh, there is lane keeping, there is four-wheel drive. It's a, it's a fully fully loaded car. I think there's a hill descent control also. I wonder why we don't get uh, all these options uh, in, in the cars that we get to buy. But the juicier SUV of the two we drove for the story is in the Tucson. Because late next year, Hyundai will kickstart the electric SUV market as it were. The car shouldering that responsibility is the Kona. And Hyundai isn't messing around. While the volumes will be low and the commercial viability of electric cars in India itself will play out over the next few years at the very least, the Hyundai Kona will be assembled from CKD kits. The Kona looks great. The edgy design is fluent even by Hyundai's ever-rising standards. The combination of the narrow lights, the little details here and there and the rake boot lid is of a thoroughly modern, eye-catching SUV. This is especially true when you see one of the flashier colours like the lime green from the launch or this orange car. This more or less is how the electric Kona will look like when it comes to India. But let's get inside, shall we? The Kona is a small SUV and it's designed from the beginning to take both a regular powertrain and an electric one. 
what we're driving today is a petrol engine with a 7 speed DCT, etc. And we're not going to get that. What we are going to get is the electric, but the interior is going to be like this. So let's talk about that. Is it the most spacious interior you'd get in a car this size? Perhaps not, but it is one of the funkiest because if you look at it, they've matched a lot of the trim bits inside the cabin to the color of the car, and that looks really good. So you can see the red seat belt, there's other red trim bits here and there. It looks good. The other thing you'll notice is just like they've done on the new 2019 Tucson, they've got the infotainment screen as a tablet that sticks out, which allows them to slope the dashboard down and sort of creates the idea that there's a little bit more space in the car than you'd uh, imagine if the dashboard was a straight thing with a fair in screen. The Kona also gets a little heads-up display that surprised me by remaining bright even when I was wearing polarized sunglasses. A lot of German cars today don't manage that. But it's mounted a little low and I had to duck to see it clearly, but still. The 7-speed dual-clutch transmission brings with it quite a few options to this Hyundai Kona. This Kona with the uh, petrol powertrain has three drive modes and we were in comfort and now we are in sport and I can immediately tell you that the throttle response is a little bit crisper. Uh, the gearbox will obviously hold on to the gears longer and it does make the SUV feel more sprightly. When the electric powertrain comes though, it's just making peak talk from zero, right? So I don't know how the drive modes will be regulated, but I understand from the guys who are making motorcycle prototypes that when you do an electric powertrain, one of your challenges is a battery management system and how it delivers the power in a linear manner. So that somebody who's used to driving a petrol or diesel engine can switch to driving an electric with as little friction as possible. Like most Hyundai SUVs, the Kona is supposed to be sporty, but it's not overtly sporty, so it's actually quite easy to drive. Now, the Tucson is perhaps softer than this, and there's more body roll when you go around corners fast, but the Kona feels sporty enough and comfortable enough, and once again, Hyundai has shown that as they mature as a manufacturer, their ability to find a balance, see that, that was a street break of hardly any problem inside the cabin, their ability to find the balance is really, really nice, and they're able to execute it increasingly with less and less effort. It makes their cars easier to drive. It makes their cars easier to live with on a daily basis. We're in Turkey, roads are very good here compared to what we could see at home. But I would imagine that the electric Kona would be actually quite nice to drive. There will be changes though because the electric powertrain will change weight distribution a little bit. Hyundai might have to retune the suspension a little bit on the electric car. But this holds the promise of a sporty feeling car that's actually quite comfortable to drive. The Kona is surprisingly nice to drive. It's got genuine verve while remaining a comfortable car to drive. Although it must be said that I was expecting the cabin to be a bit more spacious. Together, it looks like a nice, spacious, funky, modern SUV. And when you add an electric powertrain to this, I think it will be quite nice to drive. The Hyundai Kona Electric is due to come to India in the second half of 2019. Hyundai has said that it will bring around a thousand cars. They will be assembled here and the price today looks like rupees 25 lakh or so ex showroom. The price could fall if Hyundai's persistent request to the government for more support for electric cars comes through though. The Kona will also be joined by the Tucson facelift in 2019 and that's a promising car as well. Well, Hyundai Motors is giving us a lot to look forward to in the coming year. Drive. Now, Nissan is all set to revamp its brand image in India and to do so, they are going to be focusing mainly on SUVs and EVs. So, to take a closer look at the range of SUVs that Nissan has globally, we took a trip to Dubai where Nissan SUVs enjoy a stronghold. This new generation of dance music has changed the meaning of the word sunburn for most Indians. But for me, I'm going to stick to the textbook definition. I'm getting sunburned. And my idea of a party is this. The bright sun, sand dunes and big SUVs to plough through it all. Let's do some dune bashing now, shall we? This party was courtesy of Nissan India. The Middle East is where Nissan's SUV range has a stronghold and therefore it was the perfect place to sample and understand what Nissan's modern-day SUVs are capable of. The Patrol that you see here is a 2013 model which had over 1,75,000 km on the Odo and a whole lot of luxurious bulk and you can still see what it could do. We had a choice of four SUVs to drive through the day. The Patrol mothership that you see here 
the Pathfinder, which lends its design direction to the Terrano, the Nissan X-Trail that unfortunately isn't coming to India anymore given the high taxation on hybrids, and the Nissan Kicks, which is currently one of Nissan's smallest offerings in the SUV space alongside the Juke. Also as a part of the Nissan SUV Heritage Drive, we are going to be driving one of their most basic offerings in the Middle East, the Kicks. Now it may be basic, but it is very important, especially from an Indian standpoint. If it doesn't ring a bell already, the Kicks is going to be Nissan's latest offering, their latest SUV offering in the Indian market in January 2019. Now this car is different, this car is smaller, this is not the model that's coming to India. They are making a made for India, a specific for India Kicks and we will be driving that soon but for now we will be driving this to get an insight on what to expect take a look the recent teaser images revealed by Nissan India hint that the finer details like the streamlined shape for the headlights the boomerang inspired tail lights and the v-motion grille etc will look more or less similar to the kicks that you see here the India spec model, however, will have wheel arches that flare out more for an imposing stance. Given the current trend, I'm hoping to see dual-tone paint schemes too. And I particularly like the grey body tangerine roof combo sold in the United States. While the India spec capture shares its platform with the Duster and the Terrano, the kicks will be based on Nissan's versatile V platform. Compared to the car that you see here, the kicks headed to India will be longer and will sit on a higher ground clearance and a longer wheelbase. This variant of the kick then is compact and it feels all the more compact when you're driving it next to such tall buildings here in Dubai but the fact of the matter is the kicks that will come to India like I said will be a larger car. This being the compact one you also feels compact when you're driving it. It feels more like a hatchback. It's quite easy to drive and you don't get that commanding view of the road that you would expect from an SUV or a crossover. In India however Nissan A is going to pitch the kicks as an SUV and not really a compact crossover so you will get a more commanding view of the road in that sense. The quality of the materials used in our test car seem to be on par with our capture long-term tester but the kick certainly has better aesthetics than its French cousin. Now this is of course the base variant so you do not get a touchscreen infotainment system everything is quite basic even the plastics uh, they don't feel that great however in India, again, I hope Nissan pumps up the quality of plastics. They make it a more premium vehicle because that is what it's going to be pitched as. Uh, in fact, they recently announced their strategy and they have said that connectivity options, infotainment options are on top priority for all their upcoming cars. And I hope that for the India spec kicks, they get us a better infotainment system. The kicks that I'm driving right now is powered by a 1.6-litre petrol engine. It's mated to a CVT gearbox. Nissan is known to build some really good CVT gearboxes and this is no different. This engine puts out about 120 PS of power, about 150 Newton meters of torque. In India, however, I wouldn't be surprised if Nissan continues with the 1.5-litre petrol engine, the same one that powers the Renault Capture as well. The volume generator, of course, is going to be the 1.5 DCI, the diesel engine. That's where most of the sales of the kicks will come from. But I would also like to see something like this come to the Indian market. The 1.5, 105 PS motor, it's not very sprightly. This one would probably make more sense. The ride quality of the kicks on Dubai's butter smooth highways was decent. But it felt quite like a hatchback when I managed to drive it on a rough road. The suspension is a tad bit noisy and the ride gets quite jarring on the sharper bumps. Handling is pretty neutral and this isn't an enthusiast car. It remains to be seen then if the higher ride height of the India spec kicks changes things. Save for the design and the connectivity options then, the upcoming India spec model will have little in common with the Middle Eastern spec kicks that we drove. But the takeaway for me is that the car we sampled feels like a modern compact crossover that is easy to drive and more cosmopolitan in its appeal. I hope that the India spec kicks is able to replicate that and not end up feeling or being more utilitarian instead in a bid to be more of a butch SUV in comparison. Nissan has the case of the India spec capture to learn from and addressing those small but very important concerns could help them create a contender that can create waves in the 14 to 20 lakh rupee SUV bracket. Well, that's something to look forward to. We've been extremely busy this week trying to catch up on the various sports cars that have been launched in the country. What's more, let's start off with India's first hypercar, the Vazirani Shul. 
Vazirani Automotive, a Mumbai-based firm founded by Chunky Vazirani, showcased Vazirani Shul, India's first electric hypercar, earlier this week. It's been developed with inputs from the Force India Formula 1 team and what we know about it is that it's a car that sits on carbon fiber tube chassis with a 300 kg battery pack that sits on the floor behind the driver. It uses a micro turbine to charge the batteries and feeds power to four electric motors, one on each wheel. A single ratio transmission connects the two, much like the Regera. It still is at the concept stage and the first production model will roll out by 2021. latest generation of the Aston Martin Vantage now in showrooms for 2.95 crore rupees ex showroom on close inspection you note that the front fascia is a big departure from the traditional Aston Martin cars and this one owes much of its styling cues to the Aston Martin DB10 in line with the aggressive exterior the cabin sports a busier dashboard design and a comparatively lower driving position the 2018 Vantage is powered by a 4-litre twin-turbo V8 and puts out 510 PS of max power at 6000 RPM and generates 685 Nm at 2000 to 5000 RPM. Aston Martin claims that the 2018 Vantage can reach 96.56 km per hour in a mere 3.5 seconds and can reach a top speed of 314 km per hour. Interestingly, this makes the new Vantage quicker than the previous V12. Pininfarina is one of the best engineering and design houses in the automotive world and earlier this year Mahindra & Mahindra announced the launch of Automobili Pininfarina, the world's first car brand conceived to create fully electric sports and ultra-luxury cars starting 2020. Christen the PF0 for now, the brand is getting ready to showcase its first Pininfarina badged electric Hyper GT car at the 2019 Geneva Motor Show. But the big announcement this week is that the brand has teamed up with Remats in a technical partnership to provide electric powertrain and battery tech and has also roped in senior engineering talent from the German auto industry such as Porsche, Audi and other elements from the Volkswagen Group. We caught up with Michael Pershke, CEO Automobili Pininfarina on the sidelines of this announcement to know more. In our fields of Italian design meeting functionality, it's not that functionality overshadows design, but always design leads and functionality is integrated. And that's what you will see when you see pictures of a PF0. You know, we try to have an iconic design, like a sculpture, and we integrate, uh, especially in aerodynamics, as an in part of the uh, aesthetics and not overriding the aesthetics. So it was very important that design and aesthetics lead and Eros is integrated into that. And uh, that's where we think our car is very unique. When we looked at the opportunities, at the same time, of course, they go hand in hand with the challenges. One is how do you get access to superior EV performance? That's what led us to meeting with Remats, discussing their capabilities and seeing if their technology fits into our um, plans. Secondly, it was, of course, that was leading, was the design piece. How do you design a hypercar? don't have it overwinked with arrows and make it sure that it becomes an iconic piece. So that's what Pinifarina, SPA and Turin is definitely supplying in that venture. And last but not least, how we integrate that with aerodynamics, with driving uh, capabilities and that's where we bring in two very talented engineers today into our team. And last but not least, put it on a racetrack and on a normal road and validate that, that performance is usable on a day-to-day -day basis. And that will be the role of Nick Heidfeld. So the challenge is actually right now what we're covering with the right talents in the industry. Lots of exciting times up ahead in terms of performance cars. Now, estates are usually considered to be boring body styles for a family which is not looking for anything as sporty as an SUV. But Audi believes otherwise. six avant it's a ludicrous load lugger that is what it is i mean who would plonk a wheezing bi-turbo v8 in 
a station wagon and then give it 560 PS of power. What kind of a family signs up for a family car this powerful? Maybe a family that loves to sing and laugh together at over 250 kilometers an hour. Or probably a family full of shopaholics who want their stuff when they want their stuff. They want to buy new furniture every now and then. And when they want it, they want it so bad. They want a car this fast to go and get it before that impulsiveness wears off. Or probably a family that has pets that wouldn't mind enjoying that vast expanse of the boot, but in return of getting knots in their intestines every time this accelerates. When this car is only for dogs, it's not for the pussies. It goes from 0 to 100 in 3.9 seconds. Well, I personally don't know of any family or any couple or any pets that would sign up for that sort of thing. But I guess there are people like that out there in the world. Otherwise, why would Audi take this RS6 Avant that I just explained, which is already a fast car, and then make it even faster? Well, they have. It's called the RS6 Avant Performance, and that's the one I'm driving right now. Yes, it exists. At least until they build a new RS6 based on the all-new A6. Visually, it doesn't look any different, meaning that you still get a road-hugging estate with gaping air dams and humongous alloy wheels. And because this model is aging, the cabin has the same old slide-out screen, a clutter of switches and a console full of analog clocks. To enable bigger bragging rights over your 1 in a million doppelganger, the 4-litre engine now puts out 605 PS of power while the torque is still 700 newton meters. But if that sounds unusually low to you, the engine comes with an overboost function which will add 50 newton meters more for a short burst of time. Oh, and it still sounds as festive while churning out all that power. Go pedal to the metal and the RS6 Avant performance goes 0.2 seconds quicker to 100 than its lesser sibling. If you sign up for the Dynamic Package Plus, Audi will unlock the top speed of this car to 305 km an hour. And for good measure to rein that power in, they'll also throw in ceramic brakes for better stopping power. And they'll also give you the sport differential for the Cotro all-wheel drive system, which makes sure that it gives you better agility, better grip through the corners for faster corner speeds. Since practicality is a key word for this car, it comes with cylinder deactivation technology in its engine, which improves fuel economy by discreetly running as a four-cylinder engine when you are cruising out on the highway. It seems to work for our cool blue test car, returned an impressive fuel economy as well. The steering on this thing isn't exactly perfect. You need to get used to it. It's a little too over-assisted for my liking. It feels like it's a little too sensitive, even for a little bit of steering input, there's a lot of movement and that really needs getting used to. But it's just a matter of time, once you do, you can have a lot of fun. If someone tells you that this car doesn't feel involving enough to drive purely because of the steering, well, they either haven't understood this car or they have changed their definition of motoring fun. If you enjoy that sort of thing, then take the option for the dynamic ride control too. It will trade in the air suspension for a more magical one that can maintain a nearly flat body balance under cornering or braking. The system hydraulically links the diagonally opposite shock absorbers at the front and the rear. Under cornering or braking, it uses a central valve to regulate the flow of oil in the respective damper to create an opposing force to reduce roll or pitch. Being completely mechanical, this system is virtually lag-free compared to the air suspension. Needless to say, it also works more reliably on our roads. I know there are plenty of performance SUVs out there which will probably offer better practicality than the RS6 Avant. But then again, they're SUVs. They're going to get lost in that sea of SUVs that you already have out there in the world. In that sense, it's very difficult to trump the exclusivity factor of the RS6 Avant. There's literally nothing like it out there. There's nothing in the performance car haven, there's nothing in the commuter car world that offers you a package like this and that is what makes it so special, that is what makes it so likeable and that is what makes it so difficult to ignore. Well that's it 
then from us on this week's episode of Overdrive. We do hope you enjoyed watching the show as much as we enjoyed filming it for you. We would like to hear your suggestions, feedbacks, as well as comments. So write into us on Facebook, on Twitter. You can follow our latest updates on our YouTube channel as well as on our Instagram account. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.